Then I'm going to try not to get distracted by talking about polynomials because it's so much fun to talk about polynomials. And there's a lot of missing stuff about polynomials. That's pretty cool. But that's all beside the point. Today, we're going to talk about sine graphs. So we can think about graphs functions. We want to understand how uh, we can use derivatives to understand what a graph of, the function, of a function looks like. So uh, for our, let's remind ourselves that if a function is increasing, uh, the, the direction of a function is connected to the sign of the derivative of the function. So when a function is increasing, the first derivative is positive. When a function is flat, the first derivative is negative. That means we have a critical point. And when a function is decreasing, the first derivative is negative. We want to make sure that we include any points where the first derivative is undefined. We also have critical points when the first derivative is undefined. So it's not just uh, critical points happen, not just when the first derivative is zero, but also when the first derivative is undefined. But we can't say that the function is flat when the first derivative is undefined. If we think back to our original uh, discussion of differentiability, a function is not differentiable at like a corner. A corner might be a local maximum, but the first derivative is not equal to zero at that point. These same observations can be made connecting the first derivative and the second derivative. If the first derivative is increasing, then the second derivative is positive, and so on. What this tells us is that the direction of the first derivative tells us about the concavity of the function. It tells us how the function is bent. This means that the sign of the second derivative tells us about the concavity of the function. So sign can tell us about direction. Sign can tell us about concavity. Direction can tell us about concavity. What we're trying to identify are inflection points where a function is changing concavity and local extrema as a local maximum or a local minimum, where the function is changing direction, either from increasing to decreasing for a maximum or decreasing to increasing for a minimum. So a local extrema is where a function is changing direction. And what that means is that the derivative is changing sign. So when the derivative changes sign, the function is changing direction. When we're looking at inflection points, we're looking for when where f is changing concavity. So we're looking for where f prime is changing direction. So we're looking for where the second derivative changes sign. So we're going to use where things are changing sign to determine where other things are changing direction or concavity. The way we look for place, the place to go to find where things are changing sign is to find where things are zero. What we have in play here is the intermediate value theorem. If you get from point A to point B on a continuous function, you passed everything in between. So what's in play here? Since we're looking at where things change sign, we find places where a, uh, something will be changing sign by looking at where that thing is zero.
phrase it this way. Let's say find changes in sign by finding zeros. So we are going to be finding changes in sign by finding zeros and then applying the intermediate value theorem. If you went from point A to point B on a continuous path, you have reached every place on point A from point A to point B. So if we have a continuous function that is zero, and if it's positive at one side, we're, that'll tell us whether it's where it's gonna be positive on one side and negative on the other, or the other way around. So that's why we wanna find zero. Intermediate value theorem is also cool because if you look at the equator of the earth, there are two points exactly on opposite sides. At some point, there have to be two points on opposite sides of the earth that have exactly the same temperature. And this is true for every great circle around the earth. I picked the equator because that's the one that we're all familiar with. So uh, with regard to the problem uh, that we, the polynomial that we introduced that we've been thinking about a lot, uh, we took the derivative set it equal to zero and solved and we found these points negative one and three for critical points. So here we have critical points. and x equals one, where we have a possible inflection point. Since we know the shape of this graph, we know that there's an inflection point there. But we're gonna pretend that we're not, we haven't seen this yet. So we definitely have critical points at negative one and three. There are two points where the function is flat. We want to classify them as a local maximum or a local minimum. So they need to be classified as a maximum, a minimum, or neither of them. What we're going to do is we're going to build a sign graph for the first derivative. So we found two points where the first derivative is equal to zero. So I'm gonna draw, I'm just gonna draw a number line. I'm not concerned about what the function looks like or the derivative looks like. I'm just gonna draw a number line and I'm gonna mark my critical points. Here's the x-axis, I have critical points at negative one and three. These two critical points divide the number line up into three uh, regions, less than negative one, between negative one and three, and greater than three. At these two points, I know the first derivative is equal to zero. In each of these regions, the first derivative is either positive or negative, so the function is either increasing or decreasing. 
The only places we could be changing sign are at negative one and three, because those are the critical points. In each of the three intervals, F prime is either positive or negative. It can only change at negative one and three. So therefore, the function is either increasing or decreasing. If there was another point where the function is going to be changing direction, we would have seen that in the first derivative, either with a point where the first derivative is undefined or another critical point. What we're going to do, what a sine graph does, is test each of these regions, just spot, test the sine of the first derivative in each of those regions. We just plug something in. So I need something between negative one and three. I'm gonna plug in zero because zero is easy to plug in. So we're gonna choose a test point. From each interval. And we're going to see the check the sign of the first derivative in each of those at each of those points. So I just want to find out f prime of zero is going to be negative nine. So we know between negative one and three, the first derivative is going to be negative. That means that the function is decreasing. Function is flat on each of these at each of these points. Just need to plug in points from each of the intervals. So I need to plug in something from uh, bigger than three. It could be anything that we want bigger than three. Four is reasonable, but harder to plug in. I'm going to go with ten because ten is easy to plug in. That's how we count. So I need to pick anything and then just test it in the first derivative. So f prime of 10 is going to be 300, negative 60, negative 9. Otherwise known as 240, negative 9, otherwise known as 231. All that doesn't matter. This is just positive. So after three, the first derivative is always positive. And so after three, the function is always increasing. This is exactly what we saw when we were looking at the graph. Finding this out wasn't the point. Seeing the connection is the point. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the region, the interval before negative one. For x less than negative one, I just need some value. I'm going to pick something easy to plug in. I'm going to pick negative 10. So f prime of negative 10 is still 300 plus 60 minus 9. So that's going to be 360 negative 9, otherwise known as 351, which is positive. Before negative one, f prime is always positive. So 
So F must be increasing. The critical points are where the function can be changing direction. The function is not gonna be changing direction at some secret point between negative one and three that we can't see. It would have shown up in our calculations. We need to be happy about this because we should enjoy the times when we have all the information because so many times we have to act without all the information. So it's nice to know that we can make these decisions knowing what's going on. You know what I mean? It's like when you're at a red light, there's a red light on my commute to work that if I get to it after 7.30, it just waits. It goes back to a timer. It doesn't I don't set, it doesn't set off. Like if I get there before 7.30, then I pull up to the, to the crosswalk and it just says, oh, okay, stops this traffic and lets me go. But after 7.30, if I pull up to that crosswalk, it waits for a full cycle, lets the other side go first, regardless of the fact that there ain't no cars over there. It's like, oh, green light, these guys over here. I'm like, oh, there's no guys over there. It's like, oh, no, come on, let's go. It's like to nobody. And then, my, and then it's like interminable because I'm sitting there waiting, knowing that there's nobody showing up. And so I'm like this one person sitting at this stoplight. I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. But there's a reason that I don't go. I don't have all the information. There could be a car up the street that I can't see that won't be able to stop. And especially if he, if that car won't be able to stop, if I'm in the street, then I am getting hit and I never had a chance to see him, right? I didn't have all the information, so I acted like I didn't have all the information. You know what I mean? So it's nice when we have all the information. So we can see that at negative one, the derivative changed from positive to negative. We have a change in sign in the derivative. That means we have a change in direction in the function. That means we have an extreme point. Since we're changing from increase to decrease, We can say that there's a local max at x equals negative one. We have classified that critical point. We knew this already because we know what the graph looks like. It's cubic with a positive leading coefficient and there were two critical points. So it definitely has to make one turn that's a maximum and then the next turn is gonna be a minimum. And that's what we see in the sign graph. We see from negative to positive, so we see that F changes decreasing to increasing uh, at three. So we have a local minimum at X equals three. Now we have classified those for the point. We're looking for what's changing. Now we had already classified these critical points using the zeroth derivative, just because we knew the graph of the function. That's why we picked something that was familiar. We picked something that we could easily look at to make our decision. To make sure that this read matches our original read of the function. Any questions?
We can build a sine graph for f double prime doing the same thing. Now, at this point, we know that there's a, 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 an inflection point. But we do the same thing. We make a number line. We had our one impossible inflection point at one. This, is, this divides the number line into two regions. We're going to use the sine of f double prime to tell us about the concavity of f. I'm actually going to include all this stuff. So before one, the second derivative has some sign. Looks like it's going to be concave down based on the graph. Then after one, it looks like the sign has got to be positive. So the function will be concave up. This will tell us about what's going on with the first derivative. That's when the first derivative is going to be flat. And there's the, then we're going to, this is going to tell us about what's going on with the function, which we don't know yet. We're trying to determine if we have an inflection point here. But we're going to do the same thing. Choose test values from each interval. And we're going to run them through the second derivative. Second derivative is 6x minus 6, so we can see which direction this is going. There's a positive slope for the second derivative. It's going to go from negative to positive at 0. But if we choose test values, and if I pick like uh, 2, f double prime of 2 is going to be 6 times 2 minus 6, or 6, which is positive. So after 1, the second derivative is positive. which means the first derivative is increasing, which means the function is concave up. And then if I pick something on the other side of one like zero, I'll test F double prime of zero. I get zero minus six, negative six, which is negative. So before one, the second derivative is negative, just like we suspected. So the first derivative is decreasing. But more importantly, we see the change in concavity because f of x is concave down. Just as we had foreseen. confirms for us that this that we have an inflection. A lot of times knowing what the graph looks like gets us through a lot of this. And since we have a lot of have machines that will draw graphs for us, since we've built up a library of graphs that we have in our heads right away, we can see how these calculations match. So it's not about determining what's going on with the graph because if all we want is a picture of what's going on, we could just graph it on a machine. 
It's about understanding how these concepts are connected. About understanding what we mean when we say we've reached an inflection point, understanding that although the first derivative is still positive, the second derivative is now negative. So the rate of increase is decreasing. We do have to watch out for places where the first and second derivatives are zero, like if there's a lot of derivatives being zero. So for example, if we have a function f of x equals just x cubed, we have such awesome power, x cubed. We know what the graph of x cubed looks like. We can see that the derivative is gonna be zero at zero but the second derivative is also zero at zero. We have a critical point that is neither a local minimum nor a local maximum, but it is an inflection point. We have concave up beforehand, or sorry, concave down before zero, concave up afterwards. So f prime of x is three x squared. So a critical point at zero. We can see based on this graph, uh, based on the picture, graph is definitely flat. It is neither a local minimum nor a local maximum. We look at the second derivative. Based on this graph, we see an inflection point. Well, the critical point at zero was neither a minimum nor a maximum. The zero of the second derivative indicate uh, an inflection point. We do have an inflection point. However, if we have, if we bump this up by one, we get the same kind of thing, a critical point at zero as derivative is four X cubed, set that equal to zero, and we have a critical point at zero. And the second derivative has a zero at zero as well. But if we look at the graph of X to the fourth, we see that we have a local minimum at zero but not an inflection point. So based on the graph, we can see that there's a local minimum at zero, but the second derivative is also zero there, but it is not an inflection point. The function is concave up before zero. The function stays concave up afterwards. So it's not changing concavity. The function is changing direction, but not changing concavity. Whereas x cubed, is not changing direction, but it is changing concavity. Any questions, comments, any thoughts? These power functions all have a similar look to them, right? X squared, X cubed, X to the fourth, X to the fifth, kind of these bendy V-shaped graphs. 
The only difference is that the odd powers respect negatives. The uh, uh, odd power of a negative number stays negative. Even powers are those annoying friends that when you're sad, they're just like, oh, cheer up, as if that's how it works. So, oh, I'm sad today. Cheer up. Oh, thanks. Now I'm not sad anymore. As if being sad is like the incorrect thing. Sometimes being sad is the right answer. You know what I mean? Even exponents just try to make everything positive. Note that if I take the uh, x to the fifth and I stick it in absolute value signs, oh, I'm not going to let me put it back. It just takes all the negative stuff and makes it positive. So that's when we come along and say, well, hey, x cubed, why so negative? Be happy. And then they start all looking the same, right? Because they're doing the same thing, the positives and the negatives. It's just the difference in the sign. How's everybody okay? What's also cool is if you just switch the X and the Y, just a, another thing about graphs, if you switch in the, the X and the Ys, then it just, instead of like going up around the Y axis, it just goes up around the X axis. Usually we write them as functions, so we only get the top half because we have like square roots. So here, let me, um, I have to change some settings and make it an X equals Y function. C. May have cheated on that a little bit. Oh dang, I still have the functions there. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? All it becomes tricky in this section because it's easy to do nx to the n minus one. We can train nx to the n minus one all day long and you all are good at it, right? There were like two chain rule quizzes and everybody was like, oh, no, we can do this. I'm like, oh, so I just put the second one on campus. I didn't bother doing it in class. I'm like, oh, no, because you all were like, oh, we can do this. I'm like, oh, mm, yeah, you can do this. Like everything was like minor. No one like came to these chain rule, product rule, quotient rules. Like, oh, I do not know what to do. It's just like all, you're dropping signs and I'm correcting like your, how you're putting your coefficients together. Because I'm saying, put your coefficients together. No one's going to ask me like, oh, how old are you? I am two times 26. Right? That's not how you talk. You like multiply that out. But now we're talking about polynomials and I don't know what everybody has heard about polynomials. We've talked about inverse functions. I'm not sure that everybody knows that at, if we, the graph of the inverse is just a reflection along the line, y equals x. I'm not sure if you understand that reflecting along the line y equals x just means taking the x and the y and switching their positions. Because where that doesn't change is where x equals y. That's where we see no change. That's our axis of symmetry. Make sense? It, it's it's hard to know what about symmetry y'all are familiar. Mathematically speaking. All right. Along with this, here we're finding local maximums and local minimums. Local maximum means we have the highest point in a neighborhood around the point. By neighborhood, I mean an open interval around the point. So we uh, saw on our graph here, on our graph of x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x plus 27, we had a local maximum at uh, negative 1. That was the highest point near negative 1. That was the biggest kid in the school, but it was not the biggest kid in the state because if we go past negative, past positive 3, the function starts going off towards infinity, which is much bigger than whatever we're going to get if we plug in negative one. So it's not a global maximum.
So one of the things that we run into is the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem says if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, an extreme value, uh, a, a continuous function on a closed interval will attain a maximum and minimum value. A continuous function on a closed interval has a maximum and minimum value. There are extreme values for the function. These we would refer to as a global maximum or a global minimum. Um, sure, could you put them back, put them back there? Yeah, in the first place. Oh man, thank you. Score. You just made my day, man. Thank you. All right. Um, not distracted because I know there's donuts and coffee in the room. What are we talking about? Here. A continuous function on a closed interval has a maximum or a minimum and a minimum value. There is some highest point and lowest point. So look for the local minimums, check what's going on at the end points. Because if we think about that cubic, we have the high, the local max and the local min. If we go far enough away on either side, we will be above and below both of those. But if we bring those points in, if I only consider, let's say between negative two and four, then that negative one will be the highest on that interval. So when we say global, we mean like, um, on the closed interval. It's like calling the, the World Series champions, the World Series champions, even though it's kind of like on the closed interval, Major League Baseball teams. I think some other baseball league should call their championship series the universe series, and they could be the universal champions. And the tagline for their, it would be like, oh, welcome to, I don't know, Japan's universe series. Congratulate your new universal champions. And then like the tagline for the whole series is like, oh, suck it MLB. The MLB is like, oh man, we stopped at world. That's right, we are the universal champions. And then you find out that some other country is like, oh, oh, that's nice. Just one universe? We are the champions of the multiverse. Son of a bitch. So I'll send that one out for free. Non ML offer not available to MLB because you've already been running with World for so long. You know what I mean? All right, so this is what we're working on this week. Take derivative set equals zero and solve. That's not really the point of the exercise. Finding these points and knowing what the graph looks like is not the point of the exercise because if we want to know what the graph looks like, we have faster ways of doing that. This is how we look at the graph. What we want to do is make sure we understand the connection between this information, what the derivatives are telling us and what we see on the graph. That's what we want to make sure we connect. All right, that's going to do it for today. That's gonna that's gonna do it for today. 
I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day. Grab a donut and thanks for playing.